Good morning and welcome to our worship service in Jesus' name. It's good to see everybody this morning and uh, happy 4th of July as well. Is it hard to believe we're at, at the 4th of July? You know, you get to midsummer here soon, the days are getting shorter. I'm not going to dwell on that at all, but uh, um, yeah, so good to see everybody this morning. Um, yeah, just a few announcements to make. Uh, one thing, too, if you want to take a look at uh, the building or anything, uh, there, Lori has a key in the office, and they're sheetrocking in there now and doing things, so that's uh, work continues there. And excited, too, the steeple will be going up soon. Excited for that. Uh, and uh, just thinking of these last months, you know, with uh, COVID things going on, uh, we've uh, sold the parsonage. New buildings going up. In our family, we've had one wedding, now another wedding coming up, and there's just been, you know, activity, you know, too. But, uh, uh, but happy 4th of July uh, to each, each one of you. Um, just wanted to mention a couple of things. First of all, Vacation Bible School this year, July 20th through the 22nd. And uh, thankful for uh, Hannah Herner and Devony Vukanich helping organize that. Um, it'll be real family orientated, so uh, having parents be involved and, and adults as well. We're going to keep people together in groups like that, and so it'll be safe. And some most of the things will be outside, a few things inside here as well. And it's shortened up just uh, three nights, six to seven thirty. And with that, we're excited uh, to to help um, the Otter Tail County Foster Care Program, and. Uh, there are a lot of times kids that are going in and out of foster care are kind of moving very quickly from place to place and there's backpacks to go they're called that uh, there's a box out front to donate items for that and uh, various things that kids might need you know just to go as they're going to a new place even for a weekend or for extended time you know um, toothpaste, toothbrush, pajamas, you know, just things like that. And so uh, we want you to, to get involved and help, and the kids will be putting those uh, together. And uh, so, like outfits for boys and girls ages, you know, zero, you know, up to 12 years old, socks, pajamas, I mentioned, you know, just personal hygiene items, things like that too. And so, um, but pray for our vacation Bible school. And again, uh, it'll look different this year. And, uh, but it'll be a, a good time to get families and, and kids together as well. And again, uh, welcoming people watching on Facebook. Thanks for uh, uh, watching today as well. And uh, just thankful uh, to be able to gather. And uh, Saturday too, we have a, a wedding. Carl and Emily will be married here on Saturday at four o'clock. And so excited for them too, so. All right. Let's stand at this time and uh, elbow bump or say hello to each other. So. Let's remain standing as uh, I open us in prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And thank you, Jesus, that uh, we can lift up your name together. And uh, this special weekend of the 4th of July, too, we thank you for the nation that we live in, the independence, the independence that we have, and the freedom that's been fought for by so many, many giving their lives. And I pray that um, we would truly understand what that means and, and even more importantly, truly what it means to be set free from our sin. And uh, bless this time together in worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, stay standing and sing together hymn number 447, He Leadeth Me. 447. Still 
tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. A faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done when by thy grace the victory's won. In death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. He and he leadeth me. You may be seated. Just wanted to remind us to be praying for uh, those in our parish who have lost loved ones. And we had three services this past week. Uh, pray for Barney Egan, lost, or for Emily Egan with Barney's home going here. And uh, pray for the Egan family. And then uh, for... Uh, Linda Haugen, Kurt's funeral was on Wednesday, and then yesterday was Kathy uh, uh, Boos's funeral from Quam, and so we'll be praying for Ron and their families too, and so yeah. And I want to just mention something, you know, here as well too. Let's uh, continue to pray for our nation, and uh, Fourth of July is a wonderful time to remember uh, the independence that we have and. Uh, that was bloody as well. And the freedom that we have, all the blood that's been shed, you know what I mean, that's so we can live in a free country. People have served in the military too, but we have freedom. And as I mentioned, freedom in Christ too. You know, just to have our sins forgiven. But uh, it seems like this year too, a little different with uh, Memorial Day services not being able to be held. And it seems like we went through D-Day, June 6th, you know, Pretty quickly and here we're at the 4th of July you know here today too but uh, let's uh, just remember to pray for our nation but want to mention or it lists list any other prayer requests yeah Betty Proverbs 3, 5, 8, uh, trust in and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind and do not rely on your own instinct or understanding mm -hmm. God. yeah yeah you know, trust God. And trust God for everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other praises or special requests today, too? So. Thanks for air conditioning. Thanks for air conditioning. I know. Yeah. 
yeah, many people working outside in the in the heat and yeah, yeah. So praise God for the rain too, and you know right now crops and it comes at timely times, doesn't it? You know, yeah. So all right, well, let's bow in, in prayer together. Father, we thank you so much for the glory that we see all around us in creation and growth of crops and gardens and flowers and different things. And Lord, we thank you for the beauty that we see in creation and in each individual and each one gathered here this morning. Lord, just what an awesome thing how you bring people together and as we're together this morning for worship or worshiping, watching online too. We pray, Father, that you would remind us of uh, the great freedom that we have to worship you, to move about in our country. We pray for our nation today, that there would be a, a real turning to you in so many ways. We pray for revival, Jesus. And to thank you for uh, those that shed their blood and their lives for us so that we could uh, enjoy this freedom, Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood for us so our sins could be forgiven. Lord, help us to live in that forgiveness. Lord, we think of the Egan family today. We lift them up to you. Encourage them, Father. We pray for the Haugen family as well, for the Boos family. Lord, we pray that you would, uh, through the power of your Spirit, encourage each one. Lord, we think of loved ones and different ones in our nursing homes or shut in right now that are unable to be out and about. And uh, Lord, with the restrictions on visitation, Lord, we pray that you would be with each one. Father, we come before you today too and just acknowledge that we, we desperately need you and you call us to trust in you. To trust in your word, the power of your Holy Spirit. And uh, just help us to that end, to just continue to look to you. We pray for Carl and Emily as they are married on Saturday. Just bless their union, bless their marriage. Watch over them, Jesus. Lord, we do thank you for air conditioning and for modern conveniences and different things too. And we pray for those that work outside and farming and construction or whatever work that might be. And and just keep everybody safe, livestock as well, during these days of warm, warm temperatures. And again, Father, we love you today and every day, and Lord, we worship you. And I want to offer this time a time of silent prayer and, and confession of, of sin. But God demonstrated his own love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, thank you for sending your son. Forgive us of our sins, Jesus. Lord, help us to live daily in forgiveness, kindness toward each other as well. Pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand at this time and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. I forgot the... <laughs> In setting up the cameras this morning, I forgot the 
uh, uh, little microphone clip. Yeah, I just want to turn the, the camera. Hello, those of you watching on Facebook, uh, those watching on YouTube, we're still figuring this out in case uh, you haven't uh, figured that out yet. We're going to be reading uh, today's passage from the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn in there. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. cooking with grease. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, that's Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man has began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to be able to spend in your word. We pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, would you continue to teach us and guide us, encourage us? Yes, and Lord, in this passage, especially challenge us with the words that your spirit has given to us. Lord, we would ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at the passage for today from Luke chapter 14, those following along online or, or here, you can please keep your Bibles open as we look at this passage. I will admit to you that it is an extreme message that Jesus gives us in these verses. And the title of my message this morning is A Message of Extremes. And as we look at uh, this passage, I want us to use a little bit of biblical imagination, right? Imagine that you are with Jesus. Jesus is hot like it is outside, and you've been walking with him for a few miles. Uh, you're not entirely sure what city you're walking to. Luke doesn't record it here, but you're walking with Jesus, and as you're walking, Jesus starts looking around. And as Jesus is looking around, all of a sudden he starts slowing down like he's about to say something, and then he says this message that uh, we just read from Luke's account. What goes through your mind as you look at this passage today, as you consider the words that Jesus says to the crowds, and you got to rem remind yourselves, that I have to remind myself, that as Jesus talks to large crowds of people that are often around him, his voice, I don't know how well it carries, but when you've got a large group of people, it's hard for a large group of people to be quiet and silent enough for everyone to hear what's being said, especially without a speaker system or or anything like that, and Jesus doesn't have any microphones or speakers or anything like that. So here Jesus speaks to the crowd, and probably only the, a few dozen people that are around him are able to hear him. But you're close enough to be able to hear what he says. And he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. That's a tough message to hear. It's a tough message to swallow. How do you react? It's kind of the question that comes to my mind because the central question that I, I was looking at uh, in this passage is, and I'm going to open it up to the floor here for all of you to answer, why did people come to follow Jesus? Why did people come to Jesus? Yes. 
They needed help. That's very good. What kind of help did they need? That's exactly right. They needed help spiritually. They needed help with their lives. What else? Thanks for answering, by the way, breaking the ice. She answered, pressure's on the rest of you. Why did people come to follow Jesus? See what he's going to do, right? Just kind of a public public figure. What's going to happen? They want to hurt the king. They wanted, right, political figure, somebody to get behind. So that was brought up at Tordenschuld as well. They wanted somebody to, to maybe get behind, uh, get in early on this new kingdom that's being established. Maybe it was a power grab. They came to Jesus because they wanted healing. They, saw, they, wanted, they came to Jesus because he taught like nobody else had ever taught before. One who had authority. And I'll tell you what, there's some, there's some pastors out there, there's some people who preach every Sunday that, that I follow. Um, I listen to some of their, their sermons on, on podcasts when I've got some spare time in my car. I'll, I'll listen to it and it's enjoyable. Um, some of them that you, you might have heard, some of them you might not be familiar with. Um, People came to Jesus because not only was he healing people, but it's, you kind of want to watch him heal people, right? That's, it's kind of amazing. Here's this man who's been blind for his whole life. And Jesus rubs mud in his eyes, which, you know, is counterintuitive. And then as he washes the mud off of his face, he can see. Here's someone who has leprosy, right? This disease that is spread through contacting people. And here Jesus reaches out his hand and takes the man by his hand and heals him. You want to see that. You want to be a part of that. And here Jesus comes, and now a little bit more uh, biblical imagination. Imagine you're one of the disciples, and people came and left Jesus all the time. And the disciples, you know, it's really exciting to kind of have a lot of people around you to be kind of the center of attention uh, in, in this way. And, and here the disciples like, oh man, this is great. We finally have a, a crowd following us. Um, oh no. Je no, Jesus, I know what you're about to say. No, Jesus, don't say, oh gosh. He said it again, you know, his, people are coming and leaving Jesus all the time. Because what happens is when they're coming to listen to him preach or teach or do miracles, is they're coming to him for, for surface level things. And what Jesus is challenging us today in this passage is that there has to be more to our relationship with him than just this surface level stuff. And I, I think this passage is particularly applicable to us today because we live in an incredibly uh, spiritualistic, relativistic, globalized society. Now, that's a lot of big words. When it comes to uh, religion, all of that boils down to is that it's kind of like going to Pizza Ranch. Who likes going to Pizza Ranch here? Show of hands. Yeah, not a big surprise. And maybe you're, uh, what if you, what if happens if you're going to Pizza Ranch? ranch and you don't feel like pizza why are you going to pizza ranch then right but there's the chicken option right over there right the chicken's pretty good mashed potatoes about you know, the potatoes about eight different ways at pizza ranch if you're like uh, my grandpa was you'll go and make a, an entire meal out of the cactus bread dessert pizza that's there some of you know are like oh man <laughs> preaching to the choir here it is it is really good what I mean in all of that is that when it comes to spirituality and belief systems, it's kind of like going to a buffet where you can pick and choose a little bit of whatever you want to eat, and by the time you sit down, your plate looks entirely different from the person that's over there. You can pick a little bit of this, and oh, I like that, and, and here's this, and oh, I like the meditation that Buddhism has, and oh, I like the fact that Jesus tells us that we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves, and I especially like the, the part of the Bible that says, judge not. They don't quote the last part of that, that says, lest you be judged, but judge not, I like that, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to take this little part from, from Islam, and, and maybe this from some religion that you've never heard of, and guess what? Here's what I have, and this works for me 
and that can work for you, and why can't we all get along? Because our idea of God is just some, some greater deity that just wants us all to get along. And that's our idea of spiritualism. And, and this is the world we live in today. Is that people think that they can just take the top stuff from each religion and kind of compile their own religion. Over 7 billion people in the world, which means that there are over 7 billion religions. The thing is, is that when you start looking at religions and belief systems, that there are a lot of teachings that are non-negotiable. Things that you can't give up. If you give this teaching up, then you are no longer practicing this religion or this worldview. Right? For Christians, Jesus is the only way to God. That's kind of a big non-negotiable. But it's something that's thrown out with the bathwater. This is why uh, when I see uh, bumper stickers like coexist, like, you know, if you really knew what that meant, it, it, it's impossible. Jesus here is giving us this message that, that's difficult to, uh, to hear, admittedly. It's difficult to hear, and it's, it's a lot harder to, uh, to preach on clearly, because I have to get over my own selfishness. Uh, one of the uh, preachers that I like to listen to, uh, or used to anyway, was Francis Chan. And many of you are familiar with uh, Francis Chan. He had a line in a message at one point where, uh, if my church is down the road from Jesus, if Jesus and I each had our own church and we were in the same town, I guarantee you mine would be larger than his. Because people left Jesus. Because the truth that he preached was difficult to hear. He wanted people to commit. He wanted people to not just show up because it was the popular thing to do or because it was culturally acceptable. He wanted people to come because they had a genuine relationship with God. This is the relationship that Jesus desires to have with, with not just the people here, but with each and every single one of us. And it boils down to this issue of idolatry. And I bring up this point from Francis Chan about having a larger church than Jesus because, man, I want people to get it. I want people to understand the message that I'm sharing. I want people to share in the relationship that I have with Jesus. I, I, want, them to be, uh, I want them to know what I know to be true. I want them to believe it. And I will bend over backwards to make sure that they hear it. And Jesus says, no, this is, this is the issue. Come to me, but this is the cost. You need to count it. Martin Luther had uh, quite a bit to say on this, and I summarized it here with just the first sentence. He is a guy who liked to talk a lot. And, and as you read his, his writings, it, it, some of them are a little trickier to read, but uh, this one is summarized pretty well. Whatever a man loves, that is his God. If you have something taken away from you and your life is never the same, that was an idol. And the, the problem with idolatry is that we got to be careful and discerning because it's easy to love good things, isn't it? You want to surround yourself with things that you're comfortable with, things that you enjoy. But man, it's easy for really good things uh, to become an idol. Finances, it's really wonderful to have that kind of security net in, in a savings account or a CD somewhere. And if something happens, I, I have that to tap into. And if that were ever to, something were to ever happen to that, oh man, I, I don't know. That's why people, when, when the stock market crashes, people go into depressions because their security is tied to their finances. It's really easy to love the part of the country that we, we live in, but man, if something were to ever happen to that, oh man, I don't know. And I want to be really careful here too, um, but I came across a, 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 a I, I came across a study that somebody had put, it was from a study from Lifeway uh, Research Center, and they interviewed about a thousand pastors, and the, one of the questions they asked them, this was back in 2016, all right, 2016, uh, four years ago, they asked the pastors, do you think 
that your congregation members, do you think that people in your congregation love America more than they love God? That's the question that was asked. And the response, 53% of pastors said yes. You know, and, and me having just come out of a, a research-heavy uh, program, I was looking like, oh, that's interesting. Like, it's, it's pretty close. Like, tie, it's like 50-50. And then I realized what 50-50 meant here is that over half of these surveyed pastors said yes, that people love America more than God. Now, I, I, I want to be really clear here. I'm not becoming Pastor Dan, the unpatriotic pastor here. I love living in America, all right? We celebrated the 4th of July uh, yesterday. We blew stuff up. We had good food. We celebrated with family. We sweat uh, outside just like the rest of them. You know, it, I love living in the country. I love having the freedoms that I enjoy, the freedoms that I'm exercising right now to be able to, to speak to you all freely, to be able to worship freely. I love living in America, but man, if my relationship with God comes into second place because I love my country, that's idolatry. And it's easy, my point is, to have good things become an idol. This is why in the Old Testament, God tells the Israelites that he is a jealous God. Because he doesn't want to share us with anybody else or anything else. Me and me alone. Count the cost, Jesus is saying. And as we look at this passage... It's really easy to see maybe a conflict of interest compared to what the rest of the Bible says and teaches because we have, right, idolatry, kind of a big commandment. Commandment number one and two, right? You shall have no other gods before me, no graven images. That, that's kind of a big commandment. The reason it's first is because when you break all of the other commandments, right, confirmation students, when you break all of the other commandments, you're breaking the first one as well. Because you have replaced God with something else, mainly your own interests. So God tells us not to have any other gods beside him. All right, I get it, I understand. But then a few commandments later, he tells us that we ought to honor our father and mother. And a few commandments later, he tells us that we shouldn't commit adultery, that we should be loyal to the one that we are married to. And then a few commandments later, he tells us not to lie or to steal or to covet what our neighbors have. So here we have God telling us that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, and yet here he's telling us, if you don't hate your father, mother, spouse, sibling, uh, siblings, children, or even your own self, you can't be my disciple. What is Jesus saying here? What is he trying to communicate? It's not a conflict of message. What Jesus is saying is that compared to your love for Jesus, it ought to look like you hate these people. Your relationship with your spouse and with your children and with your friends shouldn't look anything close to significant compared to your relationship with Jesus. The invitation that is given to us is to seek first the kingdom and God's righteousness and all of these other things that we prioritize, that we care about, are going to be added unto us. Because when we seek the kingdom first and when we love Jesus, our love for our families becomes more significant and more defined and more wonderful and deep than it would have been if we had just loved our families by ourselves. The love of God allows us to love our families more than we were able to by ourselves. When we love Jesus, our finances, instead of being a security net, they become a tool for us to use to further the kingdom of God. When we love Jesus, we take care of our communities and we love the people around us. Not because we're altruistic and we're just trying to do a good thing because it's a good thing, but we're doing it because that's what God's kingdom is about. God tells us to take care of those around us. 
So it changes our motives for why we do good things. And when we love Jesus, we stop looking for God to bless us, right? Um, I- I'm, rem- <laughs> I'm reminded of that, that kid song, If All the Rain Drops Were Lemon Drops and Gum Drops, What a Rain That Would Be, You'd Stand Outside With Your Mouth Open Wide. And you just, like, I don't know. I, I, me as a child, I'd imagine, I'd imagine that. Like, that would be terrible. Like, that would hurt a lot. Gumdrops falling from the sky. That's just the kind of person I am. We sit like this and expect God to bless us. But when we prioritize our relationship with Jesus, guess what happens? We stop looking to receive blessings from God and instead use the blessings that he has given us in order to bless other people. We stop being the receptacle of blessings and start being the conduit to give it to someone else. Because God has blessed us, right? God has blessed us tremendously. Jesus tells us still this message as we look at Luke 14, not just to count the cost, and he says in verse 27, something that is pretty profound and pretty one direction, uh, something that is pointed in one direction. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There is one thing that a cross is used for. One thing. Considering the time that Jesus was saying this, not some decoration, it's an execution sentence. It is the, the visual representation of someone having declared that you are guilty of breaking the law. That you are guilty. You are, when you are carrying your cross, you are headed to the place where you will eventually be hung upon that until you're dead. This is the level of extreme that Jesus is talking about here. Your love for me should be so great, because guess what? Jesus is going to a cross and said, if I tell you to go, this is what we're doing today. This is what's going to happen. Follow me. Is Jesus worth the cost? Is the question that you cycle around to. Not just why do people follow Jesus, but is he worth the cost? And that's what Jesus invites us to do today. To look at what it means to follow Jesus. Yes, because following Jesus at the surface level, that's easy. And it's nice. And it's not so um, commitment intensive. There are days that are, yes, easier than others. That it's, it's easier to love your siblings and your neighbors and your parents. But Jesus is telling us that we need to be more than just surface level. Christianity is more than just a nice set of morals for us to incorporate into our life just because, oh, this looks nice and I'll have this. This is a life that uh, requires self-denial and sacrifice and, and ridicule and, and suffering. Not all the time, but there are certainly elements of it. When you're trying to consider the, the best life that you could possibly live, these, these are not elements that you would include in that. Self-denial, suffering, ridicule, no. We don't want anything to be a part of that. But that is what comes along with believing in Jesus, with following Jesus. Why? Because the world hated him. And the world will hate you. Is Jesus worth the price tag? Because those who come looking to Jesus, right, for, for only blessings are, are short-sighted and they miss the point. And those who come to Jesus just looking for wisdom and insight st- tend to stop too soon. But when you come to Jesus looking for mercy and peace, what happens? Oh, you find it. There's a parable that Jesus tells his followers that uh, there's a man who, um, digging in a field, randomly, a field that doesn't belong to him for whatever reason, he's out there with a shovel and all of a sudden he finds a treasure. And he, he kind of, he does a quick estimate and he's like, uh, let me check here. Uh, yeah, this is worth more than anything that I own. And what does he do? He buries it. And he goes and has the biggest yard sale you've ever seen. And he sells everything that he has. And to everybody else that's walking past him, that's buying all of his stuff, this man is insane. 
why in the world are you doing? Are, are you moving? Is this like a moving sound? No, I'm not moving. Okay. Thanks for the stuff, you know, and, and they leave. Why does the man do this? Because he wants to buy the field. Because what he's found is worth more than what he had. When we give our lives to Jesus, all of the things that we find security and happiness and content, contentment with, when we give that all to Jesus, and we lay that at the altar, and like Jesus is telling us here, count the cost and give it all over to God, do you know what happens when we give it all over to Jesus? He gives it all back. He says, you're a steward of all of this. You are the one who is taking care of all of these things. You are the overseer of all of this. Whether it be a lot or just a little part, you are the overseer of this. And then in, in a relationship with God, he invites you to, to honor him with that. To use that in order to bless others. That's what life as a Christian is. But I won't deny that uh, God doesn't call people to extreme measures at some point. Because we have a bulletin board in the back of our church here, full of missionaries, whom God has called to, to leave their families and to go overseas for who knows how long and to serve Him in different capacities. Um, you know, I had, um, Mark, I don't know when you, um, you, some of your seminary classmates, I had one uh, that was a former police officer uh, in Los Angeles. That was one of my classmates who's now serving a congregation. Another one that was uh, one of the um, contractors for HVAC systems in Washington, D.C. And God called them into the ministry. Sometimes God calls us to extreme things. I'm not going to deny that. But a lot of times, what God calls us to is maybe just having a conversation with them. And, you know, maybe I should go visit them. Maybe you should talk to them. You know, you, you, uh, this year has been really good uh, in, in your business and your job. And uh, maybe you need to reevaluate your, your finances. Maybe God is leading you to, to donate more. This is what God calls you to do, to take the things that he's given to you, right? Your daily bread, like we pray in the Lord's Prayer, to take your daily bread and to use it to bless others. The question, again, is Jesus worth the cost? He gives a couple of great examples here. How many of you here today have done a home renovation project? On your own. How many of you have hired others to do it? More hands, there we go. Some things you're able to do, some things you're not able to do. I found out pretty quick last year, about this time, I was putting in bamboo floors in our house, and I found out pretty quick that um, things get overpriced pretty quick. You set aside a budget, it's like, this is how much it should cost, and I don't know how many nights I spent trying to, to estimate and price out, like, okay, this is about how much, okay, yes, I know I need to add another 10% just in case something goes wrong, but I'd never done this project before, and guess what? Surprise, surprise, it costs more than we expected. Not like astronomically more, but enough. Where it was, um, if I wasn't able to finish this project, I would look pretty stupid with a half-finished floor. We have a building out here that's being built. And just, just for the sake of illustration, what happens if something were, um, if the money were to dry up, following the illustration that uh, Jesus gives here? What man, as he builds a tower, so all of a sudden he runs out of money and now he has a half-finished structure? Do you know how dumb that looks? Pretty dumb. All right? It's exciting to watch this build up, but it's it just, like, yeah. If something were to happen, like, people around town would just kind of shake their heads at us, like, man, you should have you should have thought that through before you started. Jesus gives the example here as a king who's about to go to war. 
with half the, uh, half the manpower that the opposing army has. What's he going to do? Well, uh, maybe he can have the military advantage. Maybe he can get better terrain. Maybe he has better weapons. But he's got to count the cost and figure out if he's just going to be spending all of the lives of his soldiers in this battle, because right now it's two to one odds. And that's not great. And if he's not able to, guess what? Before he even sets, before he, his army even leaves the gates of the capital, he's going to send a delegation to make peace. You've got to count the cost of following Jesus, right? There's another parable that Jesus gives. Um, this man goes out and he scatters seed on all types of soil. And some of it falls on the road and the birds eat it, right? And some of it falls on really good soil. Like some of the corn that's around here. Man, I'll tell you what, you know. Corn, this is good corn weather today. And some of that corn and some of that seed grows up and it produces a harvest, but then some of it lands in the rocks and the thorns. And it grows, but you know, it kind of gets choked out by the thorns and the weeds. And it, it grows up really fast, but it can't establish a lot of good roots. And and what happens is that the sun beats down on it on days like today and it withers and dies because its root system isn't strong. These are people who don't count the cost, who sign up and follow Jesus like, yes! But as soon as things get rougher, as soon as things start uh, piling up, as soon as the price tag becomes too high, they say, no, I can't do it anymore. Is Jesus worth the price tag? That's a question that you have to wrestle with, and, and not a question that I can give you the answer for. That is a question that you must answer for yourself. But as you consider it, that might be worth a question worth asking older Christians, especially in light of uh, the testimony that you might have, in light of the faithfulness that God has shown mankind across generations, as you consider that, is God worth the cost? My answer to that question for myself is yes, He is. He's never left me or forsaken me. He's proven Himself faithful. And regardless of the cost of what he asks, as difficult as that might be for me sometimes to admit and to take into account and to say, I understand, this was yours anyway, I was just a steward, here you go. As much as it is uncomfortable for me to give things back over to God from my stewardship, yeah, he's worth the cost. Part of my testimony, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, I wanted to be a teacher. Like in third grade, I decided, like, yeah, I can see myself doing this. And for the for a while, it's like, yeah, when I'm a teacher, it's kind of like a, a, a kid whining to their parents, like, well, I'm a parent, I'm never going to do this to my kids. And your parents, what do you say? Yeah, okay, good luck with that, you know. I was thinking, you know, when I'm a teacher, I'm never going to give tests or quizzes. This is terrible. No, you know. I had an idea of how my life could be happy and how I could find fulfillment and meaning and have a purpose-filled life. But you know, God, eventually, um, when I left uh, high school and started going to our Bible college, all of a sudden God introduced something called youth ministry into my life, and I loved it a lot. I started doing it, and I started looking forward to it. Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings, time with kids, basketball games, road trips, fly conventions, the like. And it comes to my realization here that, you know, maybe God has something better for me than what I imagined my life being like. It's entirely possible that there's more than just your expectations and standards for how to live a meaningful, purpose-filled, and enjoyable life. And what God is inviting us to do here is to take a step of faith out into the unknown and say, is Jesus worth it? Yes. Well then, whatever may come, God is going to take care of me. That's kind of what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, right? We pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we realize that God gives us all of our daily bread and He forgives us 
And we realize that wherever we go, God is still going to fulfill that. And if we believe him and take him at his word, and if he's worth the cost, then yeah, that step of faith, as small as it might be, is the first step in an incredible journey of what God has in store for you. And for some of us, yeah, that might mean leaving the country and serving overseas as a missionary. For some of us, that might mean just staying here and working, God's king and working this corner of God's kingdom in, in Ottertail County. Whatever that might be, praise the Lord that His kingdom is that wide and that vast. But God has given you things right now to be stewards of. But ultimately, it's God's. And we have to get over our idolatry of the stuff that we have and answer, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus the Lord of my life? It's a tough question to wrestle with. But you know what? God never leaves us. And he's never forsaken us. And he's with us till the end. So my prayer for us today is to be able to answer that question, is Jesus worth the cost? That we'd be able to answer that with a resounding yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you have given to us through Jesus. We thank you for his death and sacrifice on the cross. We thank you for the invitation here today, Lord, the challenge, certainly, but yes, an invitation to, to take you more seriously. To move past a surface level relationship, Lord, into something deeper, something greater, something with more significance and impact. Lord, help us to be faithful with the things that you've given to us, but Lord, help us to be faithful in the work that you have given us to do. Help us to be a blessing to others. May people come to know you through the work that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we would ask and pray all of these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. The closing hymn uh, today is a familiar one. Uh, we'll be singing number 501. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 501. And thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.